Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Today I have a very special guest. I'm very excited. I'm speaking with Muhammad Yasir Al Hanafi. Uh, so Muhammad is basically a pristine scholar from the UK. He also has a channel on YouTube called the Hanafi Fiqh channel, if I'm not mistaken, and probably much more. So basically this, the discussion is about navigating the Sunni discourse as a new Muslim. So we're going to talk about very interesting stuff. So uh, Jazakallah Khair for being here, Muhammad. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan to you, brother Yan, for inviting me. This is a pleasure. And uh, Jazakumullah khairan to all your viewers and listeners. So just a brief background. There's not nothing much to say regarding me. Uh, my forefather's parents were originally from Pakistan. I personally grew up in, in a city called Bradford, up north here in the UK. Um, I went. I did my studies Alimiya program in Dewsbury, uh, Merkaz, the Islamic Institute of Dewsbury, uh, over a period of 10 years, uh, from approximately 2001, 2002, until 2011, where I did my Tahfid of Quran, memorized the Quran, did the Alimiya program, where we did, uh, you know, the Arabic grammar, syntax, uh, morphology, and then different sciences, logic, and tafsir, and hadith, and usul, fiqh, etc., and also the Qiraat, the seven ways of uh, recitation, Qiraat, Saban, also Asha, the ten. And then we completed uh, the six books of Hadith, Qutb Sitta, uh, the six authentic books of Hadith uh, in the final year, Alhamdulillah, in 2011. Uh, since then, I've been serving as an Imam. Uh, since 2011, I've served approximately six years in Bradford. Uh, and the remaining... Uh, here in Ellsbury, Buckinghamshire, I moved here in the beginning of 2017. Uh, after I graduated, I did my under undergrad uh, in philosophy uh, and psychological studies, and I did my MA uh, in philosophy uh, at the University of Warwick. And at the moment, I am pursuing my PhD in philosophical theology, concentrating on uh, a Sanusi. Muhammad bin Yusuf as Sanusi was an Asharai scholar passed away in age nine, five years approximately. Uh, yeah, so that's a brief background to who I am. Yeah, maybe I'll give you a premise, uh, the way I want to conduct this interview. It will be very casual, so I'll probably jump in uh, to your answers. <clears throat> but uh, basically, from my point of view, as somebody who's never heard of Islam, who's never been exposed to Islam, the country's not Muslim, we've never seen a mosque, uh, when I came to conclusion, Islam is truth. Okay, that's a separate discussion. And that's sort of obvious. However, um, the discussion uh, then after several years of, let's say, practicing Islam comes or several months comes like, well, hold on, there's different ways of interpreting uh, some teachings in Islam. So as a new Muslim who has no Islamic center, no mosque, uh, no one to help, you go on Google, you go on YouTube and you start researching. And that's the, the core issue where you find contradictory positions and you start learning what's a madhab, what's akida, all these new terms, which I've never heard before. So I'm just wondering, uh, my first question would be, within Islam itself, let's say Ahlu Sunnah wal um, is there something <clears throat> like an objective truth in terms of like this fake, this akida would be objectively true? Or is there, it's still subjective where you know all of us can pray in a way which madhab we, we follow let's say but uh, it's still valid so uh, because i'm asking because people can convert to islam seeing it as an objective truth but many people want to go further i want to go further in the deen but i don't know how because you know not many people have the resources to study islam full-time so obviously they will do it part-time and um so I, that's my first question i don't know if it's very clear but yeah, no, barakallah, fikum, Allah bless you. I think your question consists of quite a few questions. So let me just dissect your question. So the first element or the first component of your question is, if you become a Muslim, what do you do? Who do you follow? And you've given a very interesting scenario where you become a Muslim, there's no masjid, there's no mosque, there's no imam or scholars around you so what do you do in that scenario i mean that's a very difficult scenario because hitherto the advice that i usually give is look if you become muslim just you know stay with your locality i know uh, stick to those people who you trust but the scenario that you've just explained 
I mean, it's a difficult one. You don't have any choice except for online. <clears throat> what I would say is in online, we have to be extremely scrupulous and careful uh, because in online discourse, you have so many different uh, views, contradictory views, channels, and this can get confusing for a, again, mm -hmm. uh, for a new Muslim. I mean, again, I would ask the question, what led this person to becoming Islam, uh, Muslim? Surely there might have been somebody involved. If yeah. there is somebody involved, maybe that would be your first point of contact. But if that's not the case, if it's completely your own journey where you picked up the Quran, for example, or you read a verse of the Quran and that sort of instigated uh, a thirst of research inside you and then that led you to accepting Islam, then it becomes difficult. So I would say online is a difficult one. Um, I can't really recommend uh, what to do online. What I can say maybe in principle is what you trust. And that is something that is uh, very important in Islam. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said, Istaf qalbak. Ask fatwa from your heart. You know, analyze your heart. What does your heart say? Yeah, so before I move on to the second component of your question, if, if, you, if you want to interject, mm -hmm. yeah, you can interject. Just quickly, uh, basically, the reason I'm asking is that there comes a point where you do your shahada and yeah. ideal scenario is you start practicing right away. You don't study 10 years and then you make your first salah. That doesn't make any sense logically. Like you should start practicing, but how? <laughs> you know, like there's a question like learn how to pray online, right? You type it in and then you get this video, this video, this video. And that's when the confusion kicks in. And if you don't have someone who's been a Muslim for a couple of years and can sort of navigate that, uh, it becomes uh, very difficult. But I would definitely recommend the same because I did. I became a Muslim in Prague, which had many mosques. So I just followed whatever they did. Yeah. And after two years, I was like, okay, I need to upgrade. This is because most Muslims, let's be honest, they are not very educated about Islam. They know the basics. But if you're asking like, okay, what? who am I? Am I Quran and Sunnah? What does that mean? They can't go further usually. Uh, so I don't blame them, but I just wanted to apply this for people who want to go further. Uh, and yeah. the intention shouldn't be because a lot of rivers go extreme uh, because they just can't find the correct pa path and they yeah. tend to stick to online sources as you pointed out. I don't recommend yeah. it, but yeah. Yeah. Now, as a point of principle, you just reminded me, as a point of principle, I would say, especially for new Muslims, and even normal Muslims, the laymen, mm -hmm. is to avoid polemics altogether. You know, difference of opinion. This is what leads to confusion, especially if you are not well-grounded in usul mm -hmm. and principles of fiqh, especially. That leads, that creates shubhat, obfuscations, doubts, and that's where the confusion come, uh, come from. So I would say, as a Muslim, new Muslim, you know, what matters the most to you is your salah, building connection with Allah, learning those things basics slowly but surely gradually and that is more important opposed to seeing you know which method is true which method is correct which method is more according to the sunnah i think the first thing is we need to have a strong basis of your worship because you just accept mm -hmm. islam for example you need to connect with your creator you need to connect with allah the last thing you want to do is get into differences of opinion and polemics i think that is a a root a root sorry root cause for many problems mm -hmm. Um, I think most reverts can sort of get through this phase because it's not difficult because basically what you're doing is just memorizing Al-Fatiha, learning how to pray. And even if you learn, even if you mix different madhabs together, you can still uh, have a valid salah. It's possible, right? You can learn how to make the wudu, even though the order might be off or the sunnah is not there. It's still valid. But what uh, once, let's say, you practice Islam, uh, so you do your basic faraid, you do also your Ramadan first time, you know, all these things. Uh, it's it, Islam looks very simple from the outside, like it's quite simple. But when you look at like, okay, now do I do my, do I do this with my hands? Do I do this? Do I do, do, do I not use my hands? Now there comes a polemic. I completely agree. You shouldn't even touch that because uh, the discussion within thick is reasonable. Within Akida, it goes to extremes. The people who go through this phase... And let's say they've established themselves as Muslim. So they pray regularly. They don't know which madhab they follow. They don't even know madhab exists. Like I didn't even know there's such a thing. I just thought I'm a Quran and Sunnah. This is what I am. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but this is what I am. And then 
at what point does it make sense to say, hold on a second, what I'm doing is not enough for me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I've just flat out my Dean, like there's no progress because obviously you need to follow Madhub to make some progress or some scholar. And yeah. why can't, now I'm going to throw some questions, objections at you, and maybe you can uh, rebuttal them. But a yeah. lot of people say, oh, well, no, we don't have to follow any Madhub, just follow the Quran and Hadith. That's enough. What would be your response to people who just say, don't get into Madhabs, just do the Quran and Hadith? Yeah. So look, epistemically, meaning in terms of how we uh, ascertain and gain our knowledge, it is impossible to directly follow the Sunnah. Meaning, if you ask somebody in this uh, perceived scenario who says, I follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the basic question would be, how do you follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Mm -hmm. You are in the year 1445, yes? It's now 6th or 7th Sha'ban. Yes, 7th Sha'ban now after Maghrib, at the time of recording. 1445, so four, 1445 years later, in the 21st century, you are claiming to directly follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How is this practically possible? Well, I follow the hadith compiled by Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari, Rahmatullahi al Imam Bukhari. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting. Which book? Uh, by the way, I don't I don't mean this as a as as a dig or a jibe of those, but most of them they don't even know the name of the book. So the name Al Jami' Al Musnad Al Sahih Al Muhtasab min Umuri Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa yamihi. This is the name of the book. Okay, you follow the hadith in there. But he also came two, three hundred years later after Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa and even between him and you. There's almost a thousand years gap. So how do you directly follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So this is where the role of madhab comes in. Well, we need to understand a few things about madhab. Number one, what does a madhab mean? Madhab means a path. It doesn't mean uh, an independent legislation like, you know, Quran and Sunnah. It is a path, it's a method. We need to get to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are 1400 years away. So we need a path to get there. Our destination is Quran and Sunnah, but our path is Madhab. So these are not two contradictory or you know, mutually exclusive, uh, exclusive notions. Following a Madhab is following a Quran and Sunnah because it is a valid interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah. So this is the first thing we need to realize that what is the role of a Madhab? Madhab is a path. It's not a legislator. We're not madhab is not Quran. Madhab is not Sunnah. Madhab is an understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. Number one. Number two, we don't follow a madhab in everything. We only follow a madhab in those masail, those issues, number one, which are ambiguous. Yes, there's not a clear cut evidence, uh, you know, where there's no contrary evidence to it. So the example that you give of raising your hand is a valid position within the madhahib, but not raising your hands in salah after the first takbir is also a valid position. So this is where the ambiguity comes. So number one is ambiguous. Uh, number two it is those issues where there's a valid scope of ikhtilaf, of difference, because that difference is transmitted from the sahaba. Yes. And, what, and number three, uh, which is the main point, the madhahib we follow in subsidiary issues. We follow the madhahib in subsidiary issues. Those issues, masail uh, fa'iyah, to do with the interpretation of deen. And there's three things that we need to remember, Brother Yan, regarding uh, subsidiary issues. Masail fa'iyah. Meaning those issues which are not to, to do with the fund, uh, foundation or fundamentals, uh, foundation, uh, you could say, tenets or in, integrals of deen. They're to do with the branches of the deen. So there's three things that we need to remember. Number one, differing in such issues is a human's nature. Differing in such issues is a human's nature. There's only two places where a person will not differ. Number one, where a person is ahmak, is a you know, is an idiot, is an income poop, is a dollar, he doesn't understand anything. He will differ. And number two, where a person is in deceptive, he has an agenda. 
However, wherever there's intellect and honesty, people differ in every sphere of life, every faculty of life, in medicine, in engineering, in politics, yes, in science, everywhere people differ. In the same way, when it comes to Masail, Fara'iya, subsidiary issues, wherever there's honesty and intellect, people differ. This is the first point. And this leads to my second point, that like the Sahaba, Ridwanullah Jma'in, they had intellect and they had honesty. You find difference of opinions amongst them. Thousands. If you pick up the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, the teacher of Imam Bukhari, you will find thousands of documented differences. Let me give you one example. Just one example. A Bukhari. A group of people came to a Sahabi named by Abu Musa Ashri, who was a faqih jurist. And they asked him a question regarding Mirath inheritance. He gave his answer. Uh, it wasn't a clear-cut uh, issue. You know, there was diff there was scope of difference. There was scope of ishtihad, investigation, and theoretical reflection. So he gave his answer, and he knew very well that you know my answer is not clear-cut. It's not categorical issue. It's not a definitive issue. Therefore, he also advised the group of people to ask Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala get his answer. And then come back to me and tell me what he said. So this group of people, they went to Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and they asked him the same question. He gave a different, a contrary answer to Abu Musa Ash'ari. So they came back to Abu Musa Ash'ari and they said, well, his answer is this, is different to yours. Do you know Yan what reply he gave? He said, لا تسألوني ما دام هذا الحبر فيكم Do not ask me any questions in the future as long as this ocean of knowledge resides amongst you in Medina. Number two, it's transmitted from the Sahaba. These different madahib are from the Sahaba. Number three, it is approved by the Prophet It is approved by the Prophet Again, there are several examples. I'm going to give you one classical example. Again, from Bukhari. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that we were traveling. We came back from the battle of Khandak, Ahzab Trench. And the Prophet alayhi salam instructed us to pray our salah in a place called Banu Quraida. A place called Banu Quraida. And he said, لا يصلينا أحد العصر إلا في Banu Quraida أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم that nobody, you know, the emphasis لا يصلينا this noon ta'akid nobody should pray the asr salah except in Banu Quraida the location Banu Quraida the sahaba they started they initiated their journey whilst they were traveling the time of asr started however they haven't reached Banu Quraida yet so now there's a dispute amongst the sahaba when do we pray our asr do we pray now whilst we are traveling or do we pray once we reach Banu Quraida? Now there are two groups. The group that said we should pray whilst traveling, they used the same hadith. They said, yes, the Prophet ﷺ did say, read your or pray your asr in Banu Quraida. But what the meaning of the hadith was, is make haste and be quick in your journey so you reach Banu Quraida by the time of asr. The, the other group who said, no, there's no such, you know, wording in the hadith. And therefore, the second group, they read, they prayed the asr after, uh, after its time, qada. But the location was Banu Quraida. So you have one group who prayed the asr on time, but the location was different to the advice of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The other group, they offered their salah in the correct location, Banu Quraida, but the timing was after, it was qada. This entire incident was presented to Prophet ﷺ. He said, both have been correct. Both have been correct. So we need to understand the madhahib, and this is where I'm coming back to your initial question, which you asked me in the beginning of the podcast, is objective truth. Of course we have objective truth. Yes? And in deen, Islam is objectively true, is the only true religion. In the in the Allah Islam. Islam Anybody who perceives a religion other than Islam will not be accepted. 
when it comes to Masail Fiqhia or the subsidiary matters, these are valid opinions. And we cannot know. Yes, we believe, like as a Hanifi, I would believe, yes, my, correct, my opinion is correct. And my interlocutor can be mistaken. But I'm not definitively sure that my is correct, is it wrong. On the, you know, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ask you, are you praying your salah according to the Hanafi school or the Shafi'i school? Yes. This is why it comes in a hadith, a mushtahid, a person who exercises ishtihad and investigation, like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed bin Muhammad. If they do ishtihad and they derive a ruling and they are correct, they will get two rewards. And if they are mistaken in their conclusion, they will get one reward. Why? Because they did ishtihad, they tried, and that was their job. They were mukallaf, they were burdened to do that. You know, they were not burdened to come to the correct conclusion. So when you come to Masail Fiqhia, we are not burdened to find out what is the truth. Because if that was the case, then there wouldn't be no difference. <laughs> there wouldn't be no difference between the four schools. Yes? And we also need to understand regarding the four schools. This is also a misconception that the four schools came to divide the Ummah. It was Quran and Sunnah and they divide into four schools. This is incorrect. If you look at history, there were more than four schools. Every city had their faqih. Yes? Every country had their scholars. You had of the Bukhara and Basra and Sabarqa and, and, and even in uh, Iraq. Yes, you had so many mujtahideen, Ishaq and Rahwai and uh, you know, other, other, other mujtahideen who had their schools. But these four schools, they survived and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the wisdom. Uh, and you could say in, in one way that there were many schools and now they've encapsulated and they've come into four schools. So they made it more easier opposed to having thousands of schools. And then the question is, why do we only, why do we only have one then? I mean, it's very simple. Like I said, it's a human's nature to have difference. It's a diversity. It is a, a means of rahmah, even though there's dispute whether this is a hadith or not. But it is in the tradition, and it is, uh, you know, there is sound narrations that the, uh, that the ikhtilaf, the differences of my ummah is a means of rahmah and mercy. Why? Because when you have different views in different circumstances, you can adopt um, and, and opt for different views. Opposed to just, you have to follow one all the time. And the other wisdom ulama give is that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he carried out different actions in different interval of times. Yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loved each of those actions so much that he's kept them revived and alive till qiyamah through the schools, through the madahi. Yes. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure if... I've, I've answered your question yeah. or I'm really more complicate, complicated. No, it, it makes sense. Basically, if maybe you can correct me, but uh, what you're saying is the madhabs are dealing with secondary issues uh, that are not clear cut in the Quran or the Sunnah. And but people, I understand their perspective, why they think what is a madhab? Why do I need to follow madhab? Because they're coming from Kufr, they're coming from church, they're coming from different things and they view this as a sect like should I now trust a human? I just found Islam. I found Allah. Like, why would I trust a sheikh who's a human like me? I know he makes mistakes. Like, every human makes mistakes. So I'm not going to blindly follow this man or his madhab. I'm going to either create my own madhab or I'm going to... This... I even went so far. Listen, I created my own deen. Before I accepted Islam, I was praying, but I didn't like it. So I was like, I'm going to create my own religion. Just make it simple. <laughs> and it didn't work. Of course, after a few months, I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> This is this doesn't make any sense because I studied Ilm al Kalam, I came to the conclusion Allah is real, but it didn't lead me to Islam. It didn't lead me to Islam. I didn't read the revelation. Uh, I just understood there's a creator, and that's not enough because even the Quraysh understood there's a creator, but it didn't lead them to, to Islam. So I think uh, these tendencies with reverts, I'm not talking from a revert yeah. perspective, exist because I then bought the Bukhari. I got the Bukhari, I'm reading thousands of hadiths. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> How am I making sense of these things? I don't know the place where they were narrated. I don't see the Isnat. I don't, I don't even yeah. know what the Isnat was back then. But like, well, who would like, okay, I understand the Quran. You need to read the Quran. Even the translation is fine. And you feel like Allah speaking to you. So that's when you get this feeling like, I just need the Quran. Leave me alone. But 
Yes, that's true. But there's many things in the Quran which you might not understand, right? Because there's just a translation issue plus many things uh, related to Akida are not clear within the Quran or uh, in terms of the, the fix. So yeah. I understand the perspective of the reverts because I've seen them all around me confused and yeah. it creates such a I mean, in the UK, it's it's a battle of uh, you know uh, online. It's it's a it's a nightmare. But here, it's even worse because we are such a small group. We have like, let's say, a thousand reverts maximum, and each of us follows different thing, because there's not one mosque, not one unity, not nothing. So you can imagine those discussions get quick takfirs, quick quick things like that, which is completely against the, any uh, uh, adab or any way of like. You know, doing these debates and they shouldn't even be done online. But uh, this is the reality we live in the age of like, I don't know what this age is. It's like, you know, there's a few there's a few things I want to mention. Look, the first thing is madhab is there to make your life easy. Yes, uh, because if you start investigating all the hadiths and the uh, the differences between the isnad, etc., you know, it's look. Can I just interject? Positive. I'll, I'll yeah. give you a simple scenario. I'll just say, oh, I don't like this hadith. I don't accept it. And it's like, wait a second, that's authentic hadith, Sahih Bukhari. I don't accept it. And people make kufri statements like daily and they don't even know they are outside of Islam. This is the worst. I don't want to tell them. I'm like, okay, you're a new Muslim. You don't even know what you're talking about. But you can't just reject uh, authentic, like 50 narrations point to this narration. Like you can't do this just because you don't understand the context. And this happens all the time. But yeah, I just want to mention, you said something from, you know, Christian, and especially, you know, from the uh, Protestant uh, sort of environment, they don't like the clergy and the hierarchy, you know, you don't want this. And I can understand why that sentiment then is, you know, is is, is, is in Islam. You know, I've accepted Islam. I want to have direct link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want these, you know, scholars in between. So what we need to understand is, this is a misconception. Nobody is saying you follow an imam or a madhab when it comes to iman, the articles of faith. In fact, uh, a very, I, could, I would say, a predominant position within the Ash'ari school, Ash'ari school is taqlid, servile conformism, blind following in aqidah is impermissible. Especially if you are able to gain knowledge. If you have qudra and you are able to gain knowledge, uh, you can't blindly follow in iman. You need to have iman in Allah. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ So when people ask, oh, well, you are just born in a Muslim family and therefore you are a Muslim. No. Islam uh, requires that we independently think we use, we employ our faculties, our Russian faculties of another theoretical reflection, and we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, as you mentioned in the beginning, you 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 alluded to the science, ilm al kalam. We have dialectical theology. Yes, even though the usage of this is very restrictive. But I'm saying we have a full science which deals with this. So the issue of blind following somebody, especially in Iman, is not a praiseworthy thing. We are told not to do this. Now, where again, where do we follow an imam or madhab? In those issues where there's difference of opinion, a valid difference of opinion, and so a lot of those differences, like I mentioned, are transmitted from the first generation of Islam Sahaba. Now, I've got two options. One option is, I spend the next 30, 40 years studying day and night and trying to understand the technicalities or option B is I just follow a trustworthy scholar who's been accepted throughout centuries. And by doing this, I'm acting upon the Quran because the Quran says, Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. <laughs> so the thing is, what we need to understand is following a madhab or following people of the knowledge, because what is following a madhab? It's following the people of the knowledge. This is why one of our teachers from uh, uh, Syria told us that there was an area where people followed the Maliki school. They followed the Maliki school. So a woman came to a sheikh and she said, uh, I need a fatwa on a particular issue. So the sheikh said, well, shall I give you fatwa according to the Maliki school? Because this area predominantly follows the Maliki school. Or shall I give you fatwa according, according to the Quran and Sunnah? 
she said, please give me fatwa according to the school of Imam Malik, rahimahullah, because he understood the Quran and Sunnah better than you. So what we need to understand is we're placing our trust upon a scholar, not in Iman, not in the articles of faith, not in definitive things, in issues where there's difference of opinion, valid difference of opinion, it's been there since first century of Islam. And if by doing this, we're making our life easy. Yes. We're saving ourselves from confusion. Yes, if you want to study, that's fine. Uh, but you've got an option. You know, if you're working nine to five job, if you're a school teacher, you're a solicitor, you're a taxi driver, bus driver. I mean, how much time do you have to study? Quick question with my story. So I chose a Hanafi Madha, but... Uh, I chose it because uh, just logically the Juma that we held, uh, I can't have a Maliki because they consider it invalid. Uh, if it's not in the like a main city, there's super a lot of conditions. Hanafis, you need yeah. three people. I mean, we have like 20, but still it wouldn't be valid for Malikis. So I just did it practically. There's no history. There's nothing. And I just did it for myself. Of course, we have many people who follow whatever they want. Um, and yeah. of course, <laughs> I'm now uh, doing my... The Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar from Abu Hanifa, you know, I'm uh, reading all the all the things uh, with the with the Hanafi Madhab so I can go deeper because how does one choose a Madhab if there's no history of Madhabs in the area? Is there a process to choosing a Madhab or is it more about no. your personal, uh, let's say, uh, you know, mm, I don't know, because there's it's not like one Madhab is better than the other. So you can, yeah. if you don't have any ties to any Madhab, you can simply choose one based on maybe your uh, convenience. convenience. I would say, yeah, convenience, your accessibility. Accessibility is very important. Uh, convenience is very important. And I would also say, you know, in a very natural way, the same question could be asked that if a person accepts Islam, if a person accepts Islam, his parents are not Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, they're non Muslims, yes? He grew up in a non Muslim family, his parents, grandparents, all of his forefathers, they're non-Muslim. I mean, how do you impose a madhab on him? We say, look, we don't Im impose a madhab on him. We say, he follows a madhab, whatever's convenient and whatever's accessible to him. In the same way, the recitation of the Quran he chooses. We, we need to understand, because the qira'at, we have differences in there too, the seven qira'at, also the, although the modality and the nature of the difference is different. However, we have half qira'at, for example, the qira'at the, uh, the that we recite is uh, Hafs and Asim, rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Asim al-Kufi, you from Kufa. So many reverts, they, they, they naturally, they um, adopt uh, a qira'at recitation without even realizing, well, I am reciting a, a version of the, uh, a recitation of the Qur'an, which is from Kufa. <laughs> yes? So I think the same methodology can be applied to fiqh. You know, again, access, whatever is accessible to you, whatever is easy to you, and whatever is convenient, inshallah. You know, the Akida question is always tricky because I already know some people will hate that uh, we are speaking together. So um, what, how... Why, why is that? Why is that? <laughs> it's just by association, guilty by association, you know. Uh, uh, this is... We love, the, we, love, we love all of them, mashallah. <laughs> right. So, but is there, uh, so let's say I choose a madhab, but my Akidah's off, or I never studied Akidah, right? So I just believe the articles of faith, but I'm really, I, I never really thought about Allah's hand or what, is it, what does he mean by that? So how do, do you choose the Akidah before you go into the madhabs or is there, it doesn't really correspond to this because, you know, in the Akidah, let's say you have people who define it differently, then you have other groups who define it differently, and then other schools who define it another, uh, make another difference. So you want to obviously follow the Akidah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but how, how do you do that? What's the Akidah of the Salaf? That's the confusion. And some people say this, 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 and as a revert again, you don't know. So how do you then go about this? Akidah first, Madhab second, or both, or I don't know. But yeah, Akida is very simple. You don't have to adopt a madhab in Akida. Mm -hmm. So you know, so when, when I, you know, if I say I'm an Ash'ari or if I'm a Maturidi, what does this mean? This doesn't mean I follow Imam al Hassan yeah. Ash'ari in, in his Iman, or, or Abu Mansur Maturi in his Akida. No, what this means is, is it has a very specific terminology. Like I mentioned to you, the of, uh, 
one of the mainstream position within the Ashari school is that you're not allowed to blindly follow anyone in Aqidah. So what does it mean following Ashari school or Maturi school? First, you don't need to follow any of these schools, especially for the layman. You don't need to be an Ashari, you don't need to be Maturi, you don't need to be any of these schools. What you need to is to believe in the six articles of faith and to amana billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa al-yawm al-akhir wa tu amana bil-qadr khayri wa sharri'u kama qaz sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like in the hadith of Jibra'il the six articles of faith you have iman billahi and the uh, and Allah wa malaikatihi and the angels wa kutubihi on his books wa rusulihi on his messengers wa al-yawm al-akhir the day of judgment and preordained matters taqdeer and uh, and the testimony to this uh, is the shahada, yes? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. This is iman. It's very simple. That's it. That's your aqidah. Yeah? These other, these, a lot of the issues uh, that are discussed on, online, they're not aqidah. This is why Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, I want to mention this. Imam Ghazali, who I highly inspire, uh, I'm inspired by, sorry, I'm highly inspired by him and who, who I highly revere. He has got a book called Iljam al Awam and Ilm al Kalam. Iljam, Iljam al Awam and Ilm al Kalam, reigning uh, the Awam, the lay public, the laymen from uh, engaging in Ilm al Kalam. And this was his final work, and he completed this work three days before he passed away three or four days. In there, he clearly mentions that you don't employ ilmul kalam, dialectical, scholastic theology. That's like medicine. You know, these Russian arguments, they're like medicine. He gives, this is the similarity he gives. And medicine, you only give sparingly to a person who's ill. And you only give the amount that they need. And only the doctor who's a specialist in prescribing medicine, they are allowed to give. So he concludes that there's only two occasions where you can use this sort of discourse in Akida. Number one, there's a shubha, a person's got obfuscation, a question, and that can only be addressed through Ilbul Kalam. Or number two, there's a student of knowledge who studied many sciences, who studied Akida for many years, they're rasikh, they are well grounded in the Akida, and now they want to study Kalam uh, to protect the Akida of the Muslims, which is you know just a speciality. We only need one individual like this in every city. So the general public, they, they, they don't even need to learn this type of discourse. In fact, I would argue for many people, these types, uh, this type of discourse can be harmful. Because what happens is they don't have yeah. any shubha, they don't have any obfuscation. You mention the shubha and then they're like, oh, I've never thought of this. And they start getting worried. And then you try to give an answer and your answer is not sufficient. So you've made a problem. Imam Ghazali discusses this. So what you do is you give them an objection and then the objection sticks to their head but your answer is not convincing enough. So it can be harmful. So just to go back to your question, Brother Yan, is you'd, Akira is very simple. Hadith of Jibra'il, the six articles of faith, Shahada. That's it. Mm. And that's, that is the Akira. Yes? And this is why one of the scholars, I'm not going to mention the name of the scholar because I'll try to keep this generic as possible. He mentioned, and it's a beautiful point, he said the Firqa Najiyah, the Saved Sect, you know, who are the Saved Sect or which is the Saved Sect? It's the general people. The Awam. Because the Iman is very simple, like the Iman of our, you know, the elders. They don't dwell and they don't, you know, uh, discuss these deep and intricate issues. It's very simple. So Akida for the most part is simple. And those people who say, well, mm -hmm. Akhi, this is issue of Akida. We need to be clear on Akida. This is Kalima to Hakkin Urida Bihal Batil, like Ali Radiallahu Ta'ala said regarding the Khawarij. It's Kalima to Hak, the statement in Rabbi Salaf is true, but the intention behind it is false. Yes, Akida is important. But well, the Akida you're discussing, the intricate issues that you're discussing, is that part of Akida? It? Is it part mm -hmm. of Akida? Also, let's be clear. Is it part of the six articles of faith? Or is it, are you giving the importance to this because you want people to be convinced uh, regarding, uh, you know, the stances or the position that you have in your school? 
Yeah. So I yeah. think as, as a student of Akida, and I said this, uh, I'm a student, uh, you know, my PhD is on Akida. Um, and the more I study Akida, the more I realize <clears throat> that Akida is very simple. And most of the topics that are discussed within Akida or Kalam is for is for a very uh, restrictive, uh, restricted public audience, you know, who are either scholars or students of knowledge, etc. And for the yeah. general public, uh, is uh, you know, it's Akida is very simple. And I think one of the uh, problems or one of the things that has exacerbated this issue is online discourse. Everybody discussing intricate issues on social media. It's Musiba. Yeah. They just get a, you know a camera, turn the camera on YouTube, and they start discussing intricate issues, which they themselves haven't understood yet. And this where you know uh, where all the problems come from. So no, yes, you don't need to. You don't need a madhab in Akida. Yeah, I think uh, it's both ways. So you get uh, you get the shubahad, you get people who will get doubts because these things are not publicly discussed. But you also get people like me who become Muslim because I would never look into Islam if it wasn't because of Ilm al Kalam or all these well, yeah, philosophical. But I want to interject because I forgot one point, which was, what does it mean that I'm an Ashari? Because like I said, so you don't you don't need to be an Ashari Maturi. So what does Ashari mean? Ashari basically means is that there's certain Masail, there's certain issues where there was difference of opinion uh, uh, you know, by other groups. Uh, for example, the Mu'tazilites, they rejected the beatific vision of Allah. They rejected the beatific vision of Allah and that, uh, you know, Allah will not be seen in Jannah because they argue that between a seeable object between a mar'i and a direction, you know, there is a luzuma aqli, there's a necessary link, a rational link, and therefore anything that can be seen has to be in a direction. And the, mm -hmm. and because Allah is not in a direction, therefore, uh, you know, he cannot be seen. This, this is an argument that they postulate. So when it comes to issues like this, we say, well, we take the interpretation of these madahib, these scholars, because we believe them to be an interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah. That's mm -hmm. what it means to be an Ashari Maturidi. It doesn't mean I'm following the Iman, the faith of Imam Abu Hassan Ashari or Imam Usul Maturidi. This is why, hypothetically speaking, Bil Farawal Muhal, Hasha, if tomorrow we had, you know, conclusive evidence, Na'udhu Billah, that Abu Hassan Ashari died without Iman, for example, or Abu Mansur Maturidi died without Iman, this will not change our Iman. I, I was just, uh, you know, simply put, like, I think 90% of Muslims are regular people who never discuss these things, because imagine a farmer in Egypt, he doesn't care, he doesn't even know what you're discussing, he just lives his life, uh, he goes to, with his cows, like, there's nothing he's thinking like that, so maybe even that farmer has a higher rank in Allah's view than a scholar who isn't honest and who's just trying to, you know, Mm, who has a bad intention in his heart and he's a scholar, you know, so uh, you never know how these things go. So, but I think vast majority of Muslims don't even know what uh, uh, is being discussed, but uh, this is uh, now because it's uh, online, it's, it's out there. But I, I just also on Al Ghazali in his letters, letters to disciple, which is also a very interesting book. He also forbids his uh, uh, like, there's only four uh, situations where he uh, allows arguing and he's like, saying like don't argue with stupid people they must have intellect don't argue with this like it's so funny because i did like a small dares uh, uh, from this book uh, and it was like really cool because it's in english as well so uh, we could you access walid? it you walid? Walid? exactly yes time. yeah yeah so um one question now more uh, more practical is uh now we took an orthodox route i moved back to my country because i wanted to do something for the dean um, and uh, alhamdulillah, basically, it's really insane that in a year, it's not even a year since we started, uh, we have a masjid now, uh, we have a community, which before we were just two people, now there's 20, 25 active members. Basically, I never wanted to do Jumas. I was always afraid, like, I cannot do Juma because I'm like a new Muslim. Um, and the students were doing the Jumas, the people who live here from abroad, but essentially, it, now I've became to do the Jumas. We became to do some uh, some lectures. We even had our uh, sort of the nikah between uh, some of some of our members, 
So it's it's really cool to see a community grow and especially for people to do shahadas with me. Like now people come to me uh, and we are doing shahadas. We had like five, six shahadas already, which is amazing. SubhanAllah, I've never, because I'm always on the opposite side. <laughs> now people come to me and ask about Islam. I'm like, I don't know anything, but okay, I'll tell you what I know. But it's like, uh, what would be your advice? Our masjid is called Masjid and Nur. And we are building it with Slovaks uh, because we want to, the problem is that a lot of masjids, there's four here in the country like let's say prayer rooms and they are run by immigrant like typically immigrants who don't really uh if people want to convert they don't go there because they are just afraid they have like bad perspective which is normal for people like i also were afraid so they come to us rather they even travel hundreds of kilometers just to talk to us about islam which is actually good like uh, because we can break those cultural barriers and explain it very quickly without mixing the culture or without doing you know uh, any weird weird stuff because but basically my question is uh we just had a scholar here and he said there's no way you can unite up on one hub, madhab here because he, uh, my uh, second uh, my other um, friend who's uh, with me he's a maliki um then i'm a hanafi then uh, there's other people in the group and we're all ahlusun al jama so we are doing some education as well just basic stuff uh but to to go forward let's say, uh, he said, like, you should all just do your own thing because essentially everything is online. So even if you, you know, uh, even if you implement one madhab here, people will pray how they were taught to pray and they will not follow this. It's not the history in Ottoman Empire that you can, like, put one madhab here and it's just going to work. It's This is over, he said. But you can still agree on where is the line in what you're following, like, what what is the limit? So is there a... Any piece of advice for us that you would give us that in one year we we just did from nothing. Now we have this community. It's working. I'm very happy. We have Palestinians here. We have, subhanAllah, we have all people from all the Ummah. And I'm doing the Juma. It's so strange to have Arabs behind me, uh, you know, because I don't speak Arabic. Uh, so anyways, I don't know if I have a specific question, but I just have a question because I spoke to a lot of people and they can't help us. Like uh, the type of advice they have is like, Okay, that's in the UK, but this is completely different like situation. And I'm using the the this podcast. I'm my intention is that uh, we fundraised five fifteen thousand euros, so they gave us the money, and we can now expand and maybe build a masjid. And we really need it. It's not like we have any organization. The government doesn't recognize us. So, in I I but I already see like in three years where we can be. I'm sure we can have hundred Muslims. I'm sure we can have two hundred Muslims here. Uh, and it can grow. Um, so I'm just wondering, what would be your advice in this stage where we've sort of said like, okay, now it works. We can uh, we can, we can, can sort of pray, do our jumas. What would be the next step maybe? Because it's fun because I'm also growing myself personally as a revert, but I'm also growing <laughs> the community with me, which is very strange experience. And uh, I don't know how to handle this. You know, in this is a, sort of a personal struggle of mine. Yes, mashallah, brother Yan, you, you are in a very unique position, mashallah. I and mean, my advice to you would be, you continue to educate yourself, to strengthen yourself, to develop yourself. Because the more you develop, the more you progress, uh, the more your community will follow, inshallah. I think the point of uniting everybody on madhab, I, 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 I don't think that's practical, and I don't think it's wise too. Mm -hmm. yes, it's, it, it might create more problems than actually solving them. So let people how they are, let uh, you know, let them be. Uh, but from a strategic perspective, or from a pragmatic perspective, I think what you need to do is continue with your studies. I think that is paramount important. Whether that is online courses, or whether that is a connection with some scholar who can advise you what to read, etc. And then from there, you uh, you know you spread that knowledge uh, through a drus, weekly drus of Quran, weekly drus of Hadith, of Shama'in, of Adab. You know, Al-Adab al mufrad Imam Bukhari, for example, a book to do with Manidism. And inshallah, through these uh, gra gradual process of uh, spreading knowledge and creating awareness, you you'll see your community, inshallah, they will also develop as you are developing. I've seen that as, you know, myself uh, as an imam. So there's certain things I want to, you know, get the community to do. 
So what I've done is first I've tried, I've started doing it myself. You know, I've learned what I need to learn. I've studied what I need to study. Then slowly I've started to explain that to the public in the Juma, for example, or on a weekly basis. And I've realized that the community around me is also picking up and that you know they're coming, they're joining me with, they're joining me in that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the same. I had the Juma today about seeking knowledge yeah. and uh, that it's like yeah. uh, one of the best things. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It's just there's only two ways. We either bring uh, someone, uh, a scholar from abroad. Um, there's issues with this because they typically come with their, mm, you know, their, their strings attached to those type of deals. <laughs> Usually, if you take money from foreign, you know, uh, mm. I don't know, government, whatever. I don't want to do that because we can fundraise ourselves, which is amazing because of this YouTube channel. SubhanAllah, this is because of you guys. Like, really, like we exist because of these subscribers. Um, oh, and sure. so, Love. yeah, and now we can fundraise ourselves even. So it's even perfect. Uh, or one of us has to go study the dean. But we're no, the, there's only two guys who are like really going deeper now, me and uh, this one other guy. And But we're doing it online. You know, we don't have... Um, uh, we're not moving anywhere. I'm not going to study in Medina. I have a family. I have two companies I'm running. I'm uh, actually like in the dunya, I'm also quite busy. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to find time at night to catch up on my, you know, reading. And I have a online check and WhatsApp group, which I, uh, it's on Arcview, you know, uh, Dr. Shadi, you had a podcast with him from the New Jersey. Hey. He has an online portal where you can study all the fix, all Akidas. And it's really good. I think it's uh, for actually Western audience, it's really good if you speak English. Uh, they can give you the the basics. Um, but yeah, I think there's no other other way because I didn't even want to do the Jumas. I just realized there's no one else to do it. And at some point you realize there's no one else to do this. And it's like you have to grow to these roles and you don't want to. And it sounds strange. It sounds sounds corny, but this is the truth. Like, subhanAllah, I never wanted this. I didn't want to study Akida and Fiqh for two years. I never wanted to touch mm -hmm. it. I just said, I'm Quran and Sunnah. <laughs> Leave me alone. And then I realized, no, this is not, this is not enough. Like, uh, so, yeah. subhanAllah. I mean, that is the injunction of the Quran that you know, a group of people should go to study. You know, وَلْيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ mm -hmm. <coughs> You know, you, you, you travel to study and you come back and you warn your people, you educate them. But in your case, as you mentioned, uh, you have many commitments, uh, family, business, etc. So what you do is you, you have to be very scrupulous and careful with timing and mm -hmm. time management is paramount. So my advice would be is, I mean, similar to what I'm trying to do is I'm an imam, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, kids, etc. I travel up north quite often to see my parents, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite about three and a half, four hours drive. Uh, I don't do my PhD full time. And I oversee a madrasa. We have students of 200 students in the evening. So there's a lot of things. So one challenge for me is that I need to have good time management. I need to have a timetable, effective timetable where I can mm -hmm. put in everything uh, as well as my personal development and studies. So I think that would apply to you too, that yes, you've got business, you're busy You're busy in the dunya, as you mentioned, uh, you've got family, etc. But I think with all all those commitments, it is still possible that you can develop and learn the team, inshallah. One of my, one of my teachers said to me, uh, was, uh, an advice he gave me, he said, look, Yasir, if you uh, want to get a job done by someone, if you need to delegate a job to someone, Give it to a person who's busy because they will get it done. Opposed to a person who's not busy, you know, who procrastinates, who do, you know, who, they don't have any timekeeping, they don't have any concept of, concept of time management. Don't give it to them because even though they're free, they won't do it. They're used to not doing things. But a busy person, they're used to executing things. They're used to uh, utilizing their time. So if you give a job to them, you know, there's a higher chance that they will get it done. So that's also on a person mm -hmm. level. You know, if you're busy and you're in that, mashallah, energetic, active mode, inshallah, you know, you, you, inshallah, you, you will study well too, inshallah. Uh, I believe in Allah, you will study well, inshallah. Inshallah. I think uh, <laughs> just waking after Fajr and just, uh, that's a 
game changer just not going to sleep but just staying after fajr and uh, starting your day from like 6 a.m is really great because in those two three hours you can catch up on so much work that when the morning starts in like the real world you're already far ahead of yeah. the rest and those two hours are really great like because you can't find two hours at, at in the evening i'm with my wife and my kid i i, I want to spend time with them as well you know so i have to really uh yeah be conscious of yeah. how i'm doing it so I, i said the same thing you just said now to my friend a few few months ago i said the most effective time for me is the two three hours after fajr and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has actually said in the hadith that the baraka the blessing of my ummah is kept in the morning so right. anybody that's listening if you want to get your jobs done and if you want baraka in your day there's a few things fajr after fajr do your dhikr and your you know your awrad with 5 10 minutes and there's another thing that I want to mention which will bring immense baraka to your life your entire day you, you know your, your day will seem like two days three days you have so much productivity inshallah is that you recite the quran in the morning every morning even if it's a few pages even if it's 5 10 minutes make a habit of reciting the quran in the morning and i assure you as the night follows the day inshallah you will see unbelievable productivity and baraka throughout the day inshallah that's that's a great advice maybe one last question where are you in the uk so uh, currently i live in uh, buckinghamshire uh, elsbury it's a town called elsbury small town not too that's far from where your Oxford. masjid is and uh, the islamic yeah. center or yeah this is our masjid alhamdulillah is it far away from london or we are about i think about 40 minutes from london 40 minutes okay. from heathrow the main area we're not yeah. far Yeah, I was just in London a few months uh, ago, but I I just went to Cambridge to visit this bamboo mosque because uh, it's really uh, oh, the really Islamic interesting. Center. The Islamic Center in uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in Cambridge. Uh, yeah, Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. The next time you come to the Yan, inshallah, please let me know. Uh, it would be nice to host you, inshallah. Inshallah, and uh, yeah, if you ever want to come to Slovakia or something like that. There's a direct flight and uh, yeah, it would be great to host you here as well. So anytime, uh, if you decide, but it's, uh, you know, we're a very different country <laughs> than the UK. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Jazakumullah khair and um, hope you enjoy your evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope everybody enjoyed. Love, love. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.